start that uh, this is the work of, of, of a group of people. It is not my work. It is uh, the work of several people I want to mention. Uh, Never left is Anna Parma, who many of you may know from Argentina, who has been a uh, member of the team. Uh, in the middle on the top is Olaf Jensen, uh, who is a professor at Rutgers University. Uh, Kobe Suzwalski is a, uh, uh, a researcher at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, Ricky Amoroso, who is right here with, with me. And then uh, also participating with us uh, is uh, uh, in various parts of the project have been another series of scientists. Uh, Carl Walters right here next to me. Um, and then I'll talk about some work done by Andre Hunt. Uh, just hiding right there behind Dave Smith, and this is uh, Tony Smith, who some of you may know, Beth Fulton, uh, Billy uh, Christensen, Keith Sainsbury. Um, so very much a group, a group effort. Uh, the work has been funded by, uh, depending on who, a, a range of different people. So uh, I and Ricky and Cody have been funded uh, primarily by the International Fish Meal and Fish Oil Producers Association and some other fishing industries. Uh, Olaf's work has been funded by a organization uh, called uh, Science Center for Marine Fisheries that is uh, jointly uh, funded by the National Science Foundation and by some industry groups. Anna Parma has received no funding uh, for this work and Carl Walters has actually been funded by Oceana. Um, okay, so first, forage fish are clearly an important part of the world food system. They are the largest fisheries in the world. Uh, they provide something like 50% of the input of fish protein uh, into aquaculture. Um, uh, the other uh, 50 percent uh, now is coming largely from byproducts rather than targeted uh, forage fish fishing. Um, and they are very important elements of marine food chains. Uh, forage fish have some very interesting and characteristic dynamics, uh, of the population dynamics. Probably the most significant is the great variability in recruitment and productivity. That almost all forage fish stocks that have been documented for uh, significant periods of time fluctuate greatly uh, between 10 and 100 fold. Associated with those fluctuations are range contractions and expansions. So when forage fish are abundant, they tend to cover a much broader geographic range than when they are rare. And finally, the, the, the recruitment to forage fish is largely unrelated to population size. That is, the big fluctuations are not uh, due to changes in spawning stock, they are due to changes in productivity. <laughs> But within any uh, productivity regime, uh, there is uh, an influence of the of spawning stock on the subsequent recruitment. So I just will expand on each of those uh, subjects um, a little bit. So this is data for the California sardine, which has been documented by uh, paleo-ecological uh, paleo methods uh, uh, back, in this case, about 2,000 years. So uh, this is the, uh, and you see there are very uh, large fluctuations of California sardine on, on a decade to multi-decade uh, scale, and well over 100 times different say, in this period than in this period. Now, there's no fishing at all going on. This is, ah, this is totally natural variability. 
Um, this is uh, the anchovy in uh, California, showing less variability, but still very great variability. Um, these are just some other uh, data sets. Here we're looking uh, now on much shorter time horizon, just the 20th century uh, estimates of either catch or abundance of uh, sardines in different places or anchovies. Again, these big fluctuations are a major characteristic of forage fish. Um, this is just some data to illustrate range contraction and expansion here in Peru at times of, uh, of high density. <coughs> Anchoveta found far offshore, low density, uh, not so much uh, offshore distribution. Uh, and certainly in the uh, United States, when sardines are abundant, they go all the way up into Canada. When they're rare, they contract to a core area. Uh, oh, yes, I have a slide to show that. <laughs> No, well, this is just comparing the distribution in two years, and uh, and you see um, going farther offshore in a year of high abundance, um, and uh, and going farther north in higher higher densities. Um, so this is just a data set to illustrate the relationship between the abundance and spawning stock and the subsequent recruitment for Atlantic Menhaden. This is from the assessment of Atlantic Menhaden done by a uh, US uh, government agency. Um, the population has not shown, whoops, has not shown uh, within this time series enormous fluctuations in, uh, in abundance like we saw with Anchoveta, but the, the total egg production, this is measured in billions of eggs, has gone from 40 to uh, about 180, almost a five-fold change, and yet there is no relationship between the subsequent recruitment. That if, if anything, recruitment on average has been higher at low spawning stock sizes than at high spawning stock sizes. So this has very significant impacts uh, when we consider uh, uh, what the uh, effect of fishing is on the predators. So the fact that there is great natural variability in over thousands of years means that predators will have evolved to deal with that variability. If they couldn't deal with that variability, they wouldn't be here. Um, and that predator abundance will almost certainly fluctuate naturally. If, if it's a predator that is very dependent on a particular forage fish species, then they're going to be less abundant when the fish are at low abundance and they'll be at higher abundance. So there's going to be natural variability in the abundance of the predators. The fact that the range of the forage fish expands and contracts means that the predators will tend to, uh, those predators who have uh, uh, breeding sites, whether marine mammals or, or, or birds, will tend to be most successful when their breeding sites are at the core of the range. That is, places that still have forage fish when the total abundance is at its low, low end. That if you're, if you're going to establish a, a breeding site, the most successful place will be the place that has the most secure abundance of the fish. Oops, oops. finally, the fact that recruitment is largely unrelated to the population size means that fishing has uh, less effect 
on the abundance of the fish than if there was a very strong relationship between uh, the spawning stock size and recruitment. Okay, so now let's think about the predators, and this uh, can be fish predators, bird predators, mammal predators. If you're going to be a predator, you're going to be most, ex oops, uh, most successful if you have a flexible diet. So uh, you, you can adapt to one species, uh, you can change your diet, if, you're, if the target for a species becomes very rare, you have the ability to switch to something else. They will set up the breeding sites in locations of most uh, stable food supply. And then, uh, in general, do go for, uh, that uh, the size of, uh, of the forage fish they eat will be specific. They will, very few predators will eat all sizes of a, of a forage fish species. They will typically have a size range that they eat could be based for a fish on just its size of its mouth. Um, on on uh, again for birds, uh, you know some birds can eat much bigger things than than, uh, than others. And for uh, almost all fish, we find that their um, their diet is very size specific. So, for example, uh, this is the. Uh, the size range from stomach contents of three species uh, for Atlantic menhaden again. This is Atlantic bluefin tuna, a very big fish, uh, spiny dogfish, uh, sort of a medium sized fish, and striped bass, which can be very big, but the primary overlap in the range of striped bass and uh, menhaden is when the striped bass are small in their first year of life. And this is the size of the menhaden in centimeters. So you see striped bass, this is the range of sizes found in stomachs, tend to eat very small menhaden. Spiny dogfish eat bigger menhaden, and bluefin tuna eat much larger menhaden. And what is shaded is the relative amount of fishing pressure on those sizes. So essentially, the fishery does not take menhaden of this size. The fishery takes, you know, 20, 25, 30 uh, centimeter uh, menhaden, which means that the fishery does not compete with striped bass. Okay? Um, and it, as it happens, striped bass is the species of probably most concern uh, about the impact of forage fishing. It's a, uh, it's a very popular sport fish, um, very popular commercial fish, and if the following two conditions are met, that fishing does not affect recruitment, which I think is fairly clear, and if the size doesn't overlap, then there's absolutely no effect of fishing menhaden on striped bass. No effect, zero. Now that would not be true for bluefin tuna. Now there, the fishery is taking the same size of bluefin tuna. The amount of impact of fishing is going to depend both on the impact of fishing on recruitment and the impact of fishing on uh, the size of fish that the predator is taking. So, there's really two approaches that have been used to understand the effect of fishing forage fish on the predators. Um, there's, and we've looked at two ways. Um, there may be more. One is to actually use data uh, on and, and look at how predators and, uh, and forage fish interact. Um, and the other is to use ecosystem models. And they both, they both have their, their roles. Um, okay, so first, what the, what the data tell us, perhaps the most surprising thing 
is there has been no systematic evaluation of the relationship between forage fish abundance and population rates of change in predators. The simple question is, when forage fish are rare, do, uh, do the, the predators increase, uh, decrease, and when forage fish are abundant, uh, do they increase? Um, we did, the team I mentioned, such an analysis just for U.S. forage fish. So that's a very limited set of the world's data. And we found no evidence that lower core fish abundance was associated with predator declines. Uh, that is not a universal conclusion, uh, I'm, um, but uh, certainly within the American data, for instance, California sardine, uh, one of their uh, key predators is uh, pelicans, brown pelicans. And brown pelicans uh, suffered greatly from uh, DDT, uh, and when DDT started to be eliminated from the ecosystem, brown pelicans started increasing quite rapidly. At a time, there were almost no sardines. Uh, and they fed on other things. Um, and there has just been no relationship between um, sardine abundance and pelican uh, rates of change. So this is just a graph for, uh, of, of all the combinations of forage fish and predators that we put together for the United States. Um, and uh, we're simply looking on the x-axis is the abundance of the prey, and the y-axis is the rate of change of the predator. And so what you would expect to see is if there was a strong relationship to If there was a strong relationship, you'd see an upsloping line that more, more forage fish, higher rates of fish. Um, right now, we have not quite completed the, uh, completed the work, but Olaf Jensen, who I mentioned, is. Uh, uh, and there are really uh, three kinds of ecosystem models that have been used to evaluate the impact of fishing forage fish. Uh, by far, the most common is uh, ecosim, uh, and ecosim, ecosim was developed by Carl Walters, one of the members of our team. Uh, uh, Atlantis is a, 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 a model developed by Beth Fulton, who was shown in that picture uh, from, from Australia. And then the third kind of model is what are called mice models, and that stands in English for models of intermediate complexity of an ecosystem. And they are, are essentially simpler versions of Ecosim or Atlantis uh, that, that contain what are considered the critical elements instead of all the elements. So uh, these are these uh, four factors that we consider very important in understanding. The natural variability of forage fish, the general lack of a spawn or recruit relationship, the size selectivity of the predators, and the shifts in spatial distribution. And the ecosystem models that have been used to evaluate fish and forage fishing essentially don't consider those factors. Uh, they do, depending upon the species, they have some size selectivity, but they never have considered spatial distribution changes. They always assume a very strong relationship between spawning stock and recruitment, and they've not allowed for any natural variability. So in the ecosystem models that have been used, the, popula the populations of predators are at their carrying capacity unless you're fishing. The only thing that affects the predators is fishing. There's no gun. Uh, in contrast, both Atlantis and mice models uh, include all of those factors. Uh, so essentially, the models that were available at the time were not designed for the task, and they were not capable of providing reliable guidance. So since then, 
there's been uh, there's been some more uh, detailed work building models specifically designed for the task. <laughs> so this is a paper uh, led by Andre Pun. Whoops. Uh, uh, led by Andre Pun here, but also including Tim Essington, who was part of the Lenfest report. Um, and uh, what they did is develop a what they call a mice model. So a, uh, in some sense simplified, but also much more explicit model, in this case of the Pacific sardine in California. Uh, and there were two key predators of concern there, the brown pelican and um, the California sea lion, uh, both of which have been on the American endangered species list. <laughs> Okay, so this is a result from their table. And these are average population size relative to its carrying capacity. And so this is for brown pelican without fishing. The average population size would be 94.2% of the carrying capacity. With fishing, the average population size would be 92.5% of the carrying capacity. Essentially, no measurable impact of fishing on the average population size. But this is the proportion of the time the pelican population would drop to less than half of its carrying capacity. And it would naturally, due to the natural variation in sardines, it would be down to uh, that half of its carrying capacity, 4% of the time. If you fish it, it would be 5% of the time. Okay? There's a difference. Yeah, fishing has an impact, but not much of an impact. Uh, the proportion of the time it goes to very low abundance, one tenth of carrying capacity, uh, nine tenths of a percent of the time, or one year in 100 on average. And here, it's a little over, a little under one year and a hundred, a little over one year and a hundred. Again, not much, I mean, a, 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 an impact of fishing, but not much of an impact. And they found absolutely no impact of fishing on California sea lions. And that's because California sea lions were more flexible in their diet than the brown pelican. So let, let me contrast that with what the ecosim model said. So remember, the ecosim model allowed for no variability. So in the absence of fishing, the populations of both brown pelicans and sardines, I mean, and, and, and California sea lions, were at their carrying capacity 100% of the time, would never go low. Uh, and because of these other assumptions, they then, they then concluded that there was a very significant effect of fishing uh, sardines on both pelicans and sea lions. But once you consider these factors for pelicans, the impact was greatly reduced, and for sea lions, it was gone completely. Oh. I uh, just want to take another look at a very simple population model uh, for, uh, for Atlantic Medellin. And so this is just a standard H-structured model looking at what's the abundance of fish of different ages, so age 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, with and without historical average fishing that's gone on. And so we start off with a uh, thousand individuals uh, at the beginning of the first year. Or, um, and this is the, uh, here's the level this is the fishing mortality rate. So it's the, uh, well it's an instantaneous rate, but it's close to what fraction of harvest. And you see there's essentially no fishing 
on age zero fish. In their first year of life, they're little fisheries, they know excellently. By the time they're one year old, some of them are starting to be caught, but not many. And the bulk of the, the main fishing mortality is on one and uh, two and three year olds. And then as they get older, like many fish, they move farther offshore and farther north, and the fishery doesn't operate there. So the fishing mortality rate on older men is actually lower. So I've calculated how many individuals at each age would be alive without fishing and with fishing. So what, zero year olds, essentially no difference. Very little difference by age two, by age one, by age two, you're starting to see an effect. You see 2% reduction at age one, 20% by age two, 45% by age three, and by age four and five, you have less than half as many individuals as you would have in the absence of fishing. But remember, there's not many of these individuals down here. And if you just take, a, a, say, a, a generic, a, a generalist predator that takes age one plus, this is how many age one plus individuals there would be without fishing, how many with fishing, total difference of about 20%. But if you take these guys, as say striped bass do, then there's almost no impact of fishing. If you take these guys, like Atlantic blue and tuna do, then there is an impact of fishing. Uh, we can look at this another way. Uh, each of these little plots is a distribution uh, of the amount of prey available, or the forage fish, at different sizes. Little, getting bigger, bigger and bigger, 25 to 36 centimeters, 20 to 25. And these are different fishing mortality rates. And you see that no matter how hard you're fishing, you're having no effect on these little guys, and it really is only bigger sizes that are affected by fish. Um, so, thus, striped bass and spiny dogfish will be largely unaffected by fishing, whereas bluefin tuna would be affected by fishing. Um, so, this is the paper that our, our, our group published in, uh, in fisheries research. Uh, and our conclusion was that model analysis must include those key biological uh, factors. Natural variability, range distribution shifts, uh, uh, the rela re relationship between spawning stock and recruitment, and the size selectivity of predators. Um, and that each ecosystem has unique features. That the idea that you can have a generic model that makes recommendations uh, very broadly just uh, doesn't recognize how different different ecosystems are. Uh, what we expect to find is that some species of predators may be really unaffected by fishing forage fish, while other species may be very sensitive. It's going to depend to a great extent on, on how general, whether the, the predators can switch. Uh, and whether the fishery interacts with the sizes that are being eaten. Um, and that really any policy recommendations need to be designed for that specific ecosystem. Uh, and uh, certainly in the United States, we've just had a, a series of uh, science policy meetings on the management of Atlantic Menhaden, and the basic conclusion was consistent with ours, that they need a model that is specific to the ecosystem of the Atlantic Menhaden, that the generic model isn't suitable for policy. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about the next steps, what, uh, what our group and uh, some of our, our colleagues are, um, are engaged in. So one is a global analysis of the empirical data, that is, Let's
let's look at, in, in different places and see what is the relationship between the, the intensity of fishing, the abundance of uh, forage fish, and the changes in the population of predators. Um, we're doing a global analysis of recruitment patterns. Um, we're, we're, we've developed a, a framework of a, of a mice model that uh, we are applying to a range of uh, ecosystems. We are actually, uh, are, we, we developed it originally for the California current sardine anchovy. Now we're applying it to the Peruvian anchovetis uh, system. And then uh, we're also looking at alternative harvest strategies to explore the trade-off between the amount of food you produce in the fishery and what that means to predators. Uh, and obviously what you want to do is find a harvest policy that uh, produces the food but has little impact on the predators. And understanding that trade-off uh, is very important. Um, I want to talk about a paper that just recently appeared um, uh, by a, a group of combination of people from here and, and people from, uh, from France. This is just uh, showing uh, the, uh, their model fit to the data for, uh, pretty sure this is cormorants, um, over time. Uh, and we're doing uh, something uh, something very similar. Uh, where th This is a very interesting paper, and I think the basic approach was very, very good. There are some, I think there's some improvements. Uh, one of the improvements is you notice that your model can never seem to predict those very low counts, okay? and talking to uh, bird biologists who are working with us, um, what they have told us is that that in, in years of very uh, bad conditions, many birds don't go to green, that they will go somewhere else and, and tr just try to stay alive. And so this, these data are not the number of former of, of pelicans that are alive, the number of uh, seen on nests. Uh, and so one of the factors we're adding to our model is, the, uh, is that, that uh, to have the uh, proportion of the birds who are counted depend on the environmental conditions. Um, also, this model did not have any age structure. Um, it's one of the, the, the features when you start looking at this data, you say, how does a population go from such low numbers to such high numbers in one year, it, uh, that uh, that's almost impossible. Uh, that the, you know, these are reasonably long-lived birds. They have uh, the, the rate of recruitment, the number of new individuals that come in, is a generally a small fraction of the total population size. And the idea that you could generate that many birds in a year, this, this has to be uh, to a great extent related to, to, to the probability of their breeding um, rather than, um, uh, than, than more specific. This is not all mortality of all birds. Uh, some of it, uh, let's see. Um, the other thing that we are doing is, uh, is if we really want to understand these bird dynamics, uh, if you go back in time, I think this data begins in 65, uh, there were some major declines in the abundance of, uh, of the birds and birds. Um, uh, anyway, we're right in the middle of this uh, at the moment. Okay, uh, okay, I finally want to close with some thoughts about the environmental impact of fishing forage fish. So there is clearly a trade-off between how many fish we take and what's left in the ocean for the ecosystem. Okay. Uh, again, the impact on particular species will depend on uh, on how how uh, what sizes they eat and how how much they can switch to other foragers. Because remember, in many ecosystems, uh, there are many wide range of forage fish species, many of which are not exploited. And in fact, uh, Billy Christensen, in his model analysis, 
has uh, estimated that the total abundance of those forage fish globally is twice as high now as it was before fishing began. And that's because fishing has primarily taken their predators and freed them from predation. So there's a lot of forage fish in the world. Now, this, this is, doesn't seem to be that true for the, for the, the, the humble current here, uh, for the Peruvian system. But for many other systems, there may in fact be more forage fish now than in, before we started industrial fishing. Uh, and that's also, some of you may be familiar with the, the more recent literature on what's called balanced harvesting, the idea that if you want to maximize the food production from a marine ecosystem, you should harvest at all trophic levels, and uh, Tony Smith and Beth Fulton from Australia have been part of that, that series of papers. Um, okay, so there are, as we fish forage fish harder, there's impacts on the marine ecosystem, but there are also impacts on the terrestrial ecosystem, and that is something that just is not considered typically when we think about the environmental impacts forage fish fishing. That is, if you reduce forage fish harvest, and let's let's take the simple example of uh, forage fish going to produce uh, feed for salmon farms, dominant use of forage fish, or certainly aquaculture. That, uh, and in fact, within the aquaculture world, there is uh, a drive. Well, there's a phenomenon and a drive to use more and more crops as feed rather than fish protein as feed. But I'll just pose a hypothetical. Let's assume we choose a harvest strategy for menhaden, I mean for uh, anchoveta, that reduces the average harvest by a million tons. The salmon farming industry is not going to stop. And in a, they are simply going to substitute other products. And if we say, let's just assume that, that as many uh, environmentalists say, well, they should switch to land-based products, okay? And they, in fact, they have been doing that, and they've been increasingly using soybeans. Okay? So what's the impact <coughs> of increasing soybean production? Well, Brazil is where a lot of the soybeans that go to the Norwegian salmon farms come from, in fact. Very, very high proportion. Uh, now, producing soybeans in Brazil has environmental costs. So, if for environmental reasons, birds, for instance, we reduce our anchoveta harvest, <laughs> salmon farmers and other aquacultures are going to do more soybean work, uh, 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 feed more soybeans. And there is a big difference between a Brazilian soybean field and the ecosystems that get turned into soybeans. In fact, I, I, uh, I, I got very interested in this when there was a, uh, uh, a US television uh, documentary uh, on, uh, well, it's on forage fish fishing by uh, Paul Greenberg, who I know, I know quite well. He was the, the lead author of, the, of it. And they, uh, what got me interested is they had a, um, an activist in Norway has little uh, remote submarines that go under salmon farms and take pictures of the, uh, the benthic community under a salmon farm. And, and they're, uh, they're pretty much biological deserts. You know, there's a, there's a lot of nutrients that come down from feces, from uneaten food, and the bottom around the salmon farm is very often anoxic and, and, uh, and pretty well uh, tra transform to look something like that, the marine equivalent of that. Okay. So I, I, I just did the simple calculation that for the Norwegian salmon farming, and you know, and he said there's all this vast area of Norway devoted to salmon farms. Okay. Uh, but it turns out there's a hundred times more area in Brazil devoted to growing soybeans for those salmon farms. hundred times the area. Um, so, as 
an environmentalist, I would say the big environmental impact of the Norwegian salmon farming business on biodiversity isn't in Norway, it isn't the areas under salmon net pens, it is in Brazil, where the food is grown, where the soybeans is grown. That's the big environmental impact of Norwegian salmon farming. So here are some reasonably rough problems. <laughs> so if we reduce the Peruvian natural gas catch by a million tons, it would require 5,000 square kilometers of Brazil to grow those soybeans. Okay. Uh, it would mean the loss of billions of plants and animals, and I've actually done a little bit of that. It would turn out that on 5,000 square kilometers of Brazilian forest, there are uh, 21 billion tons of vegetation, of thousands of species supporting millions of insects. Uh, the only numbers I've been able to get uh, very specifically is about a million parrots, um, about uh, 100,000 insectivorous birds, 230 jaguars. Uh, anyway, if you work your way through the biodiversity of Brazil, there's an enormous biodiversity cost to reducing the Peruvian and genetic catch by a million tons. The benefit in, in Brazil is you will have some more seabirds. Okay? But that's a, that's a trade-off that needs to be considered. So that's that's all I wanted to talk about. And I'd be happy to answer and the size, the, the size is basically driven not so much by the net, but by where they fish. So they they go and they fish places where they get the size of the fish they want at good catch rate. So they don't fish where the little ones are uh, because they don't, they, they, well, uh, they, they prefer bigger sizes. And they don't fish the biggest ones because they tend to be farther offshore and get lower catch rates when you go there. So it's, a, it's an economic choice of where to fish. <laughs> Pero la chuleta también eh, tiene especies, la picora, a la que comen, entre ellas el pinto que son los cetóxicos. Entonces de ahí empieza la cadena y la solemos. De la cadena trófica en el sistema marino, además del uh, pinto blanco, etc. Luego llega a, a la chuleta y finalmente a los depredadores superiores. De manera que, este, si efectivamente se hace el estudio principalmente a la principal especie de forraje que es la chuleta, las otras todavía no, no tenemos cierto conocimiento de la dinámica, por ejemplo, de lo que come la chuleta en el caso de los cáucidos, o también, digamos, también en los depredadores superiores, donde tenemos mayores estudios sobre cuál es la dinámica trófica, digamos que eso tiene que para conocer completamente y finalmente llegar al enfoque ecosistema. One of the one of the criticisms that uh, Tim Essington and Edgar Mangani made of the ecosin models is they tend to lump all of the other forage fish into a very small one group or something. Again, not and not consider the sizes there. Uh, Atlantis certainly has the capability to deal with all of those issues. Uh, but it's also a very, very complicated model and takes a lot of data. Um, but I think the, the point here, of, of, well, one of the consequences of your, of your point is that we would expect that the, the other species that are competing with Anchoveta will actually become more abundant if Anchoveta are fish. Um, I don't know enough about the, who, who those species are to know whether, you know, what, what that impact is. But, um, you know, that's, that, that's part of the design of the mice models, is 
figuring out, you know, is that something important we should include? Um, but uh, it's not something that we've, we've certainly been presenting. Yo diría, eh, sobre de que existe mayor biomasa, de que ese es forraje en el mundo. ¿no? Eh, después del de inicio de la gran pesquería, ¿no? quisiera saber eh, a, a qué especie nos estaríamos refiriendo, ¿no? de qué es el forraje, y en qué zona del mundo se estaría presentando esa mayor abundancia. ¿no? Eh, por último, el el peso más importante de Estados Unidos es el mejado. Eh, quisiera saber qué metodología utilizan para determinar la biomasa que se debe capturar en eh, un año. ¿no? Eh, y si están sometidos al sistema de cortes. ¿no? El de la respuesta de Europa es con cortes individuales a pedir de clase. Okay, let me answer those questions in reverse order because I can probably remember them. Um, that uh, the Manhattan fishery is regulated by quotas. Um, I believe they are by company rather than by individual because there's, uh, there's several large companies that dominate. It's, it's not a small boat fishery, it's a big uh, industrial fishery that is controlled by a couple of companies. Uh, and they're, they're, they are regulated by quotas that are set uh, from a harvest control rule uh, based on stock assessments, so a pretty standard American way of doing things. Um, yeah, which areas of the world do we see more forage fish? Again, that's not my work. Um, the, the paper was by Billy Christensen and Daniel Pauly, and I remember I was really quite surprised when it came out, because it basically said um, the exploited species of the world are at about 40% of what they were before industrial fishing, which is, I would say, pretty consistent with um, most of the, of the data I know. This was all model-based, though, not really data-based, but model-based. Um, but that the non-targeted forage fish, the other, you know, trophic level three fish, were at twice the environments. Okay? So I, I found that interesting because there's clearly a lot more trophic level three fish than the trophic level four and five fish that dominate world fish catch. Okay? So what that really suggested to me is these guys are telling me there's more fish in the ocean now than there were before we started fishing. Okay? That if higher trophic levels are at 40% of their prior abundance and lower trophic levels are twice the abundance, then there's more tons of fish in the ocean now. And uh, so uh, there's another um, another uh, researcher who does a lot of these models. His name is uh, Yeti Colby, and he's uh, a Dane uh, who works at, teaches at the University of Bergen in Norway. And so I, I you know, I asked him, uh, you know, is this really what these models say? And he actually. Um, has, I think, about 150 ecosin models that he has, uh, you know, on his computer and he knows how to use. And so he said, so my, my question was, are there more fish in the ocean now than before we started industrial fishing, <laughs> measured in tons? And he said, in temperate ecosystems, yes. Uh, in tropical ecosystems, probably no. And the reason was that in tropical ecosystems, the average, uh, they tend to fish more uniformly through the trophic uh, pyramid. There's much more trophic level three fishing in, in China and in Indonesia and Africa than, than, uh, than there is in the northern and southern temperate regions. We tend to harvest much higher on the food chain than they do in the tropics. Uh, and that's why they, the reason that they can produce so much yield in those places is because there's a lot more fish to be had at trophic level three than trophic level four and five. First, I want to make it clear that I'm not saying fishing forage fish does not affect the predators. 
I'm, I'm sure, I mean, it does in some cases, but it doesn't in others. There, there's, not, there's no general rule, and we need to look at each ecosystem specifically to understand how much fishing forage fish affects, uh, affects their predators. Um, the, other, the other thing is, is I would say is I, I do not like to think about ecosystems as being in balance, particularly forage fish ecosystems. These ecosystems fluctuate enormously. Uh, and uh, I started my, my career working on small mammals. And, uh, and these are uh, uh, things like lemmings you may have heard of. And they fluctuate over the course of four years quite regularly, about 100 fold. Uh, and the professor I worked with also worked on snowshoe hares. And these fluctuate 100 fold. Uh, but, you know, the idea of any of these things being in a, in a, in a, in a real balance, uh, except, a, sort of a, except in a very general sense, uh, doesn't hold up. And, and again, the department I was in at the time, the zoology department, University of British Columbia, we had two of the world's experts on uh, forest insects. Uh, and they fluctuated a thousandfold in abundance. These outbreaks of these insects, and then for 10 years there wouldn't be any, and then they would have, have outbreaks. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the senior fishery scientist there was uh, Peter Larkin, and uh, he uh, was most famous for his paper called A Requiem for Maximum Sustainable Yield. Um, but uh, he worked on uh, a salmon population, his most famous work, that fluctuated. Uh, in a good year, it had a million fish. In a bad year, it had 10,000 fish. So again, a, a hundredfold fluctuation in abundance. So um, you know that, that, that if, if there's if there's a, a balance, it's not an equilibrium in any sense. It may be a long term cyclic, cyclic balance. And what the um, you know what fishing forage fish does is change the, the, the dynamics of that's that those fluctuating ecosystems, um, and what you would expect is that competitive species will do better when you fish them. Their predators will generally do worse. Um, the question is, can we quantify how much worse uh, the predators do when we fish them? And that's that's the challenge. <laughs> más interesantes de las últimas 25 o 30 que han habido en la Sociedad Nacional de Pesquería. En los últimos tres años hay una política de proponer por lo menos un expositor de muy alto nivel al mes para ir enriqueciendo los conocimientos de los profesionales, de los periodistas, y de todos aquellos que tengan algún interés por la pesca en el Perú. Los diferentes puntos de vista de los científicos enriquecen nuestra forma de pensar y contribuyen al fin primordial que buscamos, que es mantener la sostenibilidad de las diferentes especies. La Sociedad Nacional de Pesquería ha comprado este compromiso de contribuir contra la sostenibilidad de todas las especies, pero en especial de la naturaleza que es el recurso más rico probablemente que tengamos. En esta oportunidad, el doctor Ryan Hilburn nos ha traído un punto de vista diferente, pero muy especial. Él es uno de los científicos más prestigiados de un círculo eh, elevado, de un círculo preferenciado de científicos que están trabajando sobre la sostenibilidad de las diferentes especies y de hasta dónde se puede presionar en la, en la pesca de ellos mismos. Eh, con la ayuda del doctor Amoroso, que es parte de su gran equipo, eh, han desarrollado estas, estos conceptos, nos han visitado el año pasado, han entendido cuál es la problemática del país y nos han traído estas nuevas ideas. Espero que hayan ustedes disfrutado de la conferencia y 
que hayan sacado sus propias conclusiones. Nosotros como Sociedad Nacional de Pesquería queremos agradecer al doctor Brian Hilburn y hacerle un presente en agradecimiento por su presencia y por los conocimientos que nos haya brindado. Thank you.